I want to focus on what we can do now. Yes. When somebody hurts you, you retaliate for pleasure. This is about saving lives. Well, welcome to Fill in the Blanks again. This is a follow-on to an interview that I've done before that I found so interesting and so compelling. was very frustrated that we kind of ran out of time. So I've taken this opportunity to sit down with Dr. James Kimmel Jr. again. He is a lawyer, a novelist, and a researcher at Yale University. And today we're addressing the adverse physical effects that anger and revenge have on the brain and that the brain therefore has on behavior of some people. Research says that this anger, this retaliatory behavior, is just as addictive as opioids, making them extremely difficult to resist for some people that get into this loop. And I'm being pretty imprecise with my language right now, but that's okay, because Dr. Kimmel is going to be precise with his language in describing it. Now, as I said, I had him on the show before where we discussed how science may prevent a lot of things that are going on right now in our society that we just have to get under control, whether it's school shootings, seemingly random violence, which I don't think is random at all. We're seeing more and more of this behavior since the pandemic than we've seen before. And as a lecturer in psychiatry at the Yale School of Medicine and founder and co-director of the Yale Collaborative for Motive Control Studies and the developer of the behavioral addiction model of violence, Dr. Kimmel has really dug into this in a way that I think is going to turn out to be the key to some real violence prevention. As I say, I'm convinced that he's broken the code on this. And since we talked last time, I've talked to a lot of my colleagues, from neurologists to psychiatrists and psychologists, who could not agree more. Now, Dr. Kimmel has created SavingCain.org in an effort to save lives by offering support, resources, and compassion to those that are considering murder, terrorism, mass shootings. And he's going to tell us more about that as we go ahead. But if I introduce everything that he's doing, we'll run out of time again. So I'm going to stop and just welcome Dr. James Kimmel, Jr. Welcome back. Well, thanks, Dr. Phil. And it's a real pleasure to be back. And I appreciate that very long, but very kind introduction. I appreciate that very much. Well, you're very active in this area, and it's not what you think, it's what you know. You've done a lot of research, so you come at this empirically, and that's what is so impressive about what you espouse about this. What got you so interested in this? Well, you know, what got me interested in this was my own personal experience as a, uh, a teenager, as I explained to you when we last met, you know, talking about uh, this group of guys from my high school that came to my home one night, shot and killed, killed my dog. And I had this very strong urge to retaliate against them, and, and I wanted to kill them uh, as a result of that. Uh, I was able to overcome that at the very last second. I mean, I had a by the time I stopped myself, I had a gun in my hands, but I wasn't able to shake the desire for justice that I was seeking. And, and you know, we have two meanings for justice. There's justice that's fairness and equity and righteousness, and there's justice that means retaliation and vengeance. And uh, the one that I was seeking was retaliation and vengeance. And I couldn't shake it. I became a lawyer for it. And then I ended up paying a high price as a lawyer as well. Uh, by spending a life where I was being paid to hurt other people. I mean, a, a litigator, a lawyer, is often being paid on behalf of a client to retaliate against, to hurt the person who hurt them. Now, whether you're a plaintiff's lawyer or a defense lawyer and you're trying to defend that, but in either side of that model, it's really what it's about is that socially acceptable retaliation, which is better than street vengeance, It's a step forward in human progress, but I believe we can go beyond this, uh, beyond that level. You say you 
did this as a lawyer and paid a high price for it. Did you think that you were in the loop that you've now identified as a lawyer? Did you get the payoff in the moment when you were a lawyer and you would exact that pound of flesh? I, sh- you know, I sure did. I got it over and over again. And that, uh, it, I, at the time, this is um, 15 years ago, I didn't, I didn't understand what's happening to me, but I sure knew that every time I would win it's something as simple as a motion or even an, you know, an email, you know, a pissing contest between lawyers, uh, you know, that, and that's what happens. Uh, every one of those gets you a little high or a little, a little shot, a little victory uh, where you feel, you know, kind of high as a kite. And then you're left sort of feeling worse, but chasing it down again and wanting that hit again and again, you know, and again. And what was uh, particularly fascinating for me is I was seeing this same behavior in my clients. I began to think that I was selling them a drug because they were willing to pay me ungodly sums of money to get these hits of, of uh, pleasure as well. Every time I was able to you know, inflict some pain or suffering on the other side, whether it was the other side's lawyer or the person that they were representing. As this progressed, uh, it, it's so conflicted with you know, what my inner values were for uh, as being a, a human being and, and starting to realize I'm being paid to hurt other people. That, that was a tough realization for me and I didn't see a way out of it. Uh, and I felt very hooked into this, into this lifestyle and into this mess. And this brought me to a point of such uh, dis- depression and despondency, you know, that I was, you know, I was, I was considering suicide at one point. And this, that realization that I even, and, and this is what the thing was, it, uh, I felt I wanted justice against me. I wanted revenge against me at that point. And that's when I thought, this looks like an addiction. This, this doesn't seem like normal behavior. This seems like what I knew from uh, people who were addicted to narcotics or alcohol or tobacco. Th- this seemed like that. But no, there was nothing in the literature. Nobody has ever was at that time, and only until recently, largely me, have, have figured this out and concluded that this is an addictive process. And that only came really from my personal experience of looking at addiction and seeing myself as an addicted person. And then, you know, God struck with this fantastic set of neuroscientists who have been doing studies at what's going on inside the human brain when somebody is harmed and they're retaliating. And to my amazement, the exact same brain structures and neural pathway that's activated for substance addiction is being activated or was being activated for somebody like me who's caught in this revenge seeking cycle for pleasure. And that's what it's all about. When somebody hurts you, you retaliate for pleasure. You're trying to make yourself feel better from the pain of the grievance. Now, when you say it's the same pattern as we see in addiction at a neurological level, We are able to see on fMRI the same pathways light up that we see with addiction to heroin, opioids, whatever. There are certain pathways that we can see light up that involve the pleasure centers of the brain, the motivational centers in the limbic system and all that caused people to seek this out again and again and again. And we've been able to see those same pathways light up with certain other non-chemical experiences. One of them is what you're describing here. So when you say it's the same neurological pattern, that's what you're talking about. And that's why I say this is empirical. Right. There is empirical evidence now that we have that shows that grievance and revenge seeking looks like other behavioral addictions, such as gambling addiction, sex, food, um, internet, gaming addictions, those things that are considered behavioral addictions. You're not ingesting a substance, you're engaging in a behavior. So we think about the definition of what is an addiction. An addiction is engaging in a behavior. that is harmful to you and you can't stop doing it, right? That's a compulsive, compulsive behavior 
that is harming you. Gambling harms you. Uh, gaming ultimately can become harmful. And revenge seeking is the most harmful behavior you can engage in because what you're doing is to gratify your to gratify your lust for pleasure, you have to harm somebody else to get that. That's the most dangerous behavioral and really the most behavior it's even more dangerous than a substance addiction because in, with substance addiction, the person that's most hurt is the addict who's ingesting the narcotics and their family, of course, and sometimes the community can be ravaged by these things. But that's not at the same scale of world war. And it's not the same scale as nuclear war. We all know if the world ends as a result of a nuclear strike, that'll be because nations gave in to their craving for revenge and they launched the retaliatory response, end of civilization. That's how dangerous this particular human uh, behavior is. It's been part of our lives since you know, Cain and Abel, uh, but we're just now discovering why. Yeah. Now, let me not put the cart before the horse too much. Here's the question, in your opinion, is this always dysfunctional? No. So there would be an argument, and uh, evolutionary uh, psychologists and evolutionary biologists would make some form of argument that would say, look, humanity was selected into doing this. Uh, but some of the suggestion is, is, well, we were selected into becoming super predator revenge seekers, which is kind of what we've become here in 2022. We're just right. getting better and better at being able to uh, instantly measure that we've been wronged and retaliate with all forms of force, whether it's, you know, from a tweet to an AK-47 or, you know, an AR-15. And evolutionary, evolutionary psychologists would say, well, you know, maybe that's, we were selected into this through evolution uh, as, a, as a process for helping to pacify. Uh, so to, in other words, to cause people in a society to form norms or follow norms, I should say, norms behave, norm behaviouring, which is to say keeping people in line, right? If there's somebody that's a bully running around, you want to stop the bully. You can stop the bully by retaliating against the bully. The problem with that argument, though, is, is that we know now that it's the desire for revenge that is driving the bully. So is it really an accurate way of looking at it? If we were, if natural selection had wanted us to be uh, revenge predators in order to, re you know, create peace in a society, it would have selected us to be forgiveness addicts, not revenge addicts. Because the people who forgive, who are the, the people in our society who are the best at forgiving the fastest and to do that repeatedly are the people that are the least threatening in any society. Uh, and, and the most likely to maintain peace in their community versus people who are violent. Now, that doesn't mean, and I'm not saying, and I've, I've had this question many times, I'm not saying that a person who commits a crime, a violent crime, shouldn't be incarcerated as quickly as possible while they present a threat to society. But I am saying that there's a different way of deterring that violence or preventing it. And that's now a public health prevention and treatment approach. And I'm glad in your introduction, you, you mentioned prevention. And public health is all about prevention and treatment, not just one or the other. And this is a different approach from only relying on prisons and law enforcement to work our way out of a dangerous, violent society. It doesn't work, it, it's, it's failing. I and mean, we have to all acknowledge, we have the best police forces, the most well-armed, the most surveillance we've ever had in society. We have all sorts of ways to be able to pound people into submission, but the pounding into submission isn't working and just adding more retaliation from the government really isn't gonna solve the problem. We need now more of a prevention and treatment approach from the ground up that says, we're not going to just retaliate against people. We're going to show them how to manage these dangerous revenge cravings from youth. And we're going to, uh, in adulthood, when somebody's a, at a risk, we're gonna help teach them how to recover from their addiction just the way we do with addicts. Back in uh, the 30s and 40s, back in prohibition time and before, when alcohol and drug addiction was uh, becoming a significant 
um, danger in society, the thought was these are people, these are moral deviants, and we need to use law enforcement to pound them into submission and pound this addiction out of them. And you know, as a psychologist, that doesn't work. You cannot, you know, you cannot law enforcement your way out of, of an opioid crisis, and you really can't law enforcement your way out of a violence crisis either. That's what I think we're going to have to come to reckon with in society is where you're going to need more than just more cops, although we need more cops. Well, we're certainly not going to arrest our way out of the drug culture. We're not going to arrest our way out of much at all. But what I do know is there is an intersection between law enforcement and public health. And that's what I love about your model. I don't like to use absolutes like all and none and always and never. And I'll violate that by saying I believe that all human behavior is on a continuum. So if you see violent behavior, it's in the extreme, but it's on the continuum with really peaceful, passive behavior. It's just, it's human behavior. It's on the continuum. When I think about these acts of violence we're seeing now, like these people attacking the homeless and pushing people onto the subway tracks in New York City, for example, or walking up and cold cocking somebody with a steel post or hitting them in the back of the head on the sidewalk, these kinds of things, they are on the continuum of human behavior. That's why I said, is it always dysfunctional? Because I think about sports. When I was in what's now called middle school, we were poor as a snake and a snake has no pockets. So, I mean, it was the currency for me because I didn't have like clothes and any of the things that other kids had in the school I was going with. Currency for me was athletics because when you stepped on the football field or whatever, it didn't matter if you had designer clothes or shoes or lived in a nice neighborhood. It was could you run fast, jump high, and knock somebody down? So it was pretty predatory behavior, and it was rewarding. If you could run somebody down or knock them down, there was definitely a high from it, and that was my social currency. That's what I was known for. I went to college on a football scholarship. That was my currency. And so I can 100% tell you there was a payoff for being very physical. I also know when I moved into the athletic dorm in college, I looked at some of those people and thought, these are animals. <laughs> I, have, I have nothing in common with some of these. I mean, they're like eating beer cans and live goldfish and stuff. And I'm like, like, I don't belong here. <laughs> uh, but it was on the continuum. And I think about military and police officers and stuff. And some of them, you think people are either cut out for that or they're not. I knew when I was in college athletics, I thought, I'm good at this to a certain point, but I'm not cut out for it. I took a very cerebral approach to it and I was not cut out for it. But it did serve a purpose for some of those people. It was their currency then, and it was their ticket out. I would get in the huddle, the defensive huddle, and somebody had knocked them down, blocked them really well the play before, and it was like, I'm going to get that son of a bitch. I can't wait for the next play. I'm going to lay his ass out. I mean, they. it wasn't about the game. It was about retaliating against that guy, and that was their motivation, and it worked for them. They'd run through a brick wall to get to this guy. Was that dysfunctional? In that paradigm, it served to motivate them. Now, did they go on to be muggers, buggers, and thieves? I don't think so. But in that paradigm, it worked for them. Well, I like your language about continuum. So, you know, maybe we can agree, and most of society has with the laws we have, that it becomes dysfunctional when you're physically harming somebody without their consent. Maybe we can use that as at the, the point at which re retaliation becomes dysfunctional. You're right. Um, in, in business, in litigation, uh, 
even a child in a classroom wanting to compete with uh, another child over who's going to get the most, uh, the you know, the most number of A's in a semester. And if uh, the one, you know, their adversary gets more than they do and uh, this motivates them, uh, they want to, you know, win that battle and put that adversary down and it motivates them to study more. Is that dysfunctional? No, and I'm not saying that that's dysfunctional. On the other hand, if that same child in that same circumstance went to the home of that adversary, broke a window or shot a dog or actually physically attacked their adversary, that would be dysfunctional behavior. I think that's where the line is drawn. And that's what, that's really why we're talking about this, right? We're talking about physical acts of violence, dangerous violence, and not sports violence where both sides consent. Hey, when I step on the field, I agree that you can cream me. You can knock me into the dust, but you're agreeing I can do the same to you. Well, I have two boys. They're seven years apart, and both of them are highly trained in the martial arts. They competed. And in high school, if there were 100 boys in the class, they would be number 100 of kids likely to get in a fight because the new had worn off of it for them because they Mm -hmm. fought every day in a controlled environment. You try to get them in a fight, kids get out, try to prove the man who they're like, hey, listen, no, I agree. You're tougher than me. No problem. (laughs) Got it. Don't want to get my shirt torn. No problem. I would see them in competition and one second they're kicking their opponent in the head. Ten seconds later, the match is over and they're saying, hey, you want to go throw the Frisbee? It was totally situation specific, mutual competition, like you said. And seconds later, they're asking the guy, hey, you want to go throw the Frisbee outside until our next matches are up? Yeah. And that's where I saw it contextualized in a way that was not sociopathic and dysfunctionally addictive, even though they were highly competitive. As soon as it was over, it was like, hey, let's go get something to eat or let's go throw the Frisbee around outside. That's what demarcated it for me. And we might go beyond that and say it's actually therapeutic. It's a part of prevention and treatment. And I think what you're talking about is, uh, you know, so if we want to move beyond this and go, what do we do? For instance, like you just said here, sports and those types of activities were able to help teach your boys, right? how to manage these retaliation cravings uh, and use them in a safe manner to discharge this, because you're all going to have these cravings. I mean, we, none of us escape it. We all get it. So how do we manage it? What are our tools? What can we, what can we do to teach our you know, younger generations, our current generations, adults? Everybody needs this. How do we manage it? Sports have always been effective at doing that. And I think it has, there's a therapeutic value to it uh, as long as you leave it on the field. You know, we have examples where that doesn't occur or when something on the field crosses the line. And that means that that person lost control and the therapeutic value was left and a lesson was learned. Uh, So I think that, that activities like that, revenge seeking that's controlled, like you said, I think it's beautiful. You know, then when your sons were confronted with a a true uh, opportunity to attack somebody uh, outside of that context, they said, "Hey, I'm, I'm, I, I, I've learned. I, I don't want any part of that." Yeah, for them, it was like, "No, I'm good." They were taught, "You've learned these skills for defensive purposes," yeah, and the discipline of that was very, very clear. Hmm. So there is a difference, and I think your model is something that should be added to the police academy in part of their protocol so they understand. You know, you got to ask yourself, what's your motive in how you're handling these suspects or what you're doing? Because it can get toxic. And I think that's what defines a badge-heavy police officer. They're getting way too much currency out of what they're doing. And I think if they understood that, just even the insight, the awareness alone could make a huge difference. Because if you see it coming, you know it's coming, you can address it. Sometimes you can defuse it. Sure. There's a profession, the police, 
uh, that subjects itself knowingly to victimization on a daily basis. A police officer puts on that badge and goes out into the community. They are, they are almost more than any other profession, perhaps, on a daily basis, being paid to uh, experience the worst of humanity, to experience the most abuse you could possibly experience, including up through physical attacks, uh, gunshots, and all of the rest. And it, it's pretty tough to ask a person who puts themselves in that situation, who, you know, at some point, who's been victimized as many times as a police officer would be in a day or in a career, uh, to not, to, we shouldn't be surprised that they're going at some point to retaliate and lose their control. Right. And you're absolutely right. Letting law enforcement know that that's what's going on uh, inside their brains uh, can help address these instances of abuse of, of force and police brutality, which we know, you know, statistics show those are retaliation actions. The police aren't just selecting one day to go out and pummel somebody. Most of the time, they are retaliating for uh, an act of disrespect, uh, betrayal, uh, failure to obey an order, something, you know, because they, they believe that they have the right to do what they're doing and somebody resists it and they just all of a sudden, you know, retaliate. And it makes them feel better just like the rest of us. And there is a lot that uh, academies can do pretty simply, I think. And all of this, I think the, the, the important insight about all of this is, is we have invested billions of dollars in how to uh, help people recover from addiction, how, people, how to treat addiction. Many of those same techniques are, are applicable to this. That's the kind of nice thing. The, the good news is here, once you identify it as addiction, you have a whole panoply of options for helping people manage it without having to reinvent the wheel with all new forms of uh, treatment and prevention programs. A lot of the addiction and treatment programs that we have are going to be applicable here. And they're going to be applicable everywhere from school bullies to law enforcement officers and the military. When you train, tra I'm sorry to, uh, but you know, you train men and women to go to battle and kill people and then bring them home again. And, and I've talked to veterans with no, no training support or prevention or treatment whatsoever to help them control those revenge cravings that saved their lives. You asked about dysfunctionality. I mean, you got to retaliate in battle or you're going to be killed. Then you come home, your re revenge gratification instinct has been so finely developed and we do nothing to support these veterans in helping them bring that back down again. There's got to be a transitional bridge yes. where there's a new set of behaviors that you call up. You get that cue that brings up this instinct in you and you got to say, okay, this is a cue for coping. I'm either going to go down path A or I'm going to go down path B you got to teach them to recognize this is a choice point and you have a new set of coping skills for this than blowing up the world, which I think is a whole new approach to domestic violence because that's where this dorsal striatum comes into so much play because in the domestic violence situation, it is so habitual. I mean, this can happen three, four times a day certainly multiple times a week. So it becomes very habitual, becomes an overlearned behavior. They go on automatic pilot and they don't even think about this. Whereas if we can show them a red flag where they understand, look, this is what's happening to you here. What I fear is all the talking therapy in the world without acknowledging the neurological aspects of this, it's like them being on a racetrack with no exit ramp. You got to create an exit ramp for them to get off of this where they realize, man, when I get triggered this way, I'm headed for a big payoff here. And this dopamine flood is real powerful when I'm enraged. And I've got to find a way to get paid off without that. It just seems to me that this could be a really powerful protocol for helping those that are having problems with domestic violence, anger management, whatever. They're approaching this with purely talking therapies. It's oversimplifying to say they're being taught to count to 10, but there's more to it than that if they need to understand this. 
Yeah, you're right. And you know, the the statistics are that domestic violence is the result of retaliation. One of the two partners in the relationship, and it's usually then it becomes circular and they both feel victimized and they're both seeking retaliation to make themselves feel better. And this becomes this vicious cycle. So it, a lot of effort was put into saying, well, men are, a, you know, a domestic abusers because it's about, you know, power and, and, and the battle of the sexes. And I think that that misled a lot of work uh, and, and didn't stop a lot of domestic violence as a result. If we start to see what's going on as, is that this is a revenge gratification experience inside the relationship and it has become habitual. It fits all of the diagnostic criteria or virtually every one of them for, for a substance addiction. And then we start to treat and prevent the perpetrator. Uh, we'd make a lot of headway but when I've talked to women violence groups, they often don't want to hear this message because they think that it's a light touch on abusers. Yeah, they think it's giving them an excuse. It, right. They think it's giving them an excuse and a free pass. And, and I'm saying it, it's not at all. It, it, this is, do you want to prevent it or do you just want to retaliate again and keep that cycle going? And it's been a bit tough to get that message across to that population of people. And I understand it because women are the by far the most victimized and they've had it and they should have had it long ago. And I get that. But if you really don't want it to happen again, then you really need to use a science-based public health approach to it uh, instead of just relying on law enforcement to lock up every uh, domestic abuser. Because you, as you said, you cannot arrest your way out of it. When I was a graduate student, we had to go volunteer and do groups with child abusers, molesters, and those that had been arrested for domestic violence. There were these groups at the county, and we had to go. And I, of course, as a graduate student, I went down there knowing everything there was to know about everything. <laughs> I was going in there as the expert and got a very rude awakening because when I went in with these wife beaters— I thought, boy, this is going to be embarrassing for them. They're going to hang their heads, be embarrassed to be there. Most arrogant, belligerent bunch of sons of bitches mm. you've ever met in your life. It was like, I'm here. She should be here. You're kidding me that I have to. I mean, they were no remorse in your face, just total victims. Total victims. Total victims. They had been victimized by her, were being re-victimized every time they walked in the room. When I called on them to speak, they were being victimized again. And I was just sending them home just mega pissed off now mm. <laughs> uh, when I held them accountable. It's like I felt like I needed to call every one of their homes and say, you need to go somewhere for a couple of hours because I've really pissed him off now. <laughs> right. Again, they were just victimized. I see now with the things that you're saying and I thought about this when we talked several months ago, that so much of that was just setting it up to go to the next level of abuse because that just wasn't part of the protocol. So I went in there knowing everything, knew nothing about what to expect or what to say. And the wives need to hear, they're totally accountable for everything they've done. This is talking about defusing the grenade going forward. We're not excusing what they've done. They need to be full accountable. And if it's a year in the pen and that's what you need, then fine. But this is to keep you from getting killed in the future. Yeah, exactly right. And and you look at that uh, spiraling relationship and the resistance I get is, well, you know, there's no way that the guy is a victim. And I get that message. You're no man in the relationship would be the statement is enough of a victim to justify physical violence against this woman. And I, I couldn't agree more. But you need to open yourself up to, but the guy believes, is convinced that he's a victim. And he may be in some ways. Yeah. We can't just stop with the victimization. We have to acknowledge that it causes this uh, retaliatory flood of dopamine. And he is now moved into a violent offender out of his victim out of his perceived victimization even if 
a panel of judges would say, you're not a victim here. But he's convinced, just as you found out when you walked in there, they're going, get out of here. Of course, I'm a, you know, I don't want to hear. She should be in this jail right now with me because look at all of the stuff that she's done and nobody's listening to him. And you're right. And so he's getting more and more pissed off. And then he's going to go back and go, now you got me arrested. And now I'm going to come after you again. And it's going to be twice as bad because we've done nothing to help that man control his revenge cravings when he's been triggered. And it, you're right. You, we talk about drug cues and drug triggers, and that's what all this is about. It's that sense of injustice. And for men, it's about humiliation. It's about betrayals. I mean, a man who's humiliated in a relationship or senses that he's being betrayed in some way, that, boy, that is a powerful trigger for this desire to retaliate. And that applies up to Vladimir Putin, who believed that he was humiliated and betrayed and decided to invade Ukraine. I mean, it's not just in domestic abuse situations. It, it's at all extreme levels. Uh, but yet humanity has been messing around with violence for 5,000 years, and we haven't understood why, and we haven't understood these root biological causes. And so I'm, I'm just grateful for you know, your voice in spreading this message, because it's one that needs to be heard now. Well, it does need to be heard. And furthermore, People need to acknowledge that this is an intersection between law enforcement and public health. I'm not asking cops to not arrest these perpetrators, because while this is a long-term solution and it is a prevention program, these people are a problem right now today. I did a episode recently with some folks that were talking about the fact that the real problem here starts in the neighborhoods. It starts with the upbringing. It starts with the lack of role models. It starts with all of the social influences and upbringing with these young men that were left with no alternatives, and so they made bad choices, and so they wound up in prison. And putting them in a cage for five years does nothing to help them. So that's why they support defunding the police. They just wouldn't understand that I agree with them completely that that's how they got from where they were to where they are. But if I have a home invasion and somebody is holding my wife at the business end of a shotgun, I don't give a shit what his childhood was like. I don't want a social worker to come right. explain to me how downtrodden he was. I want a cop to come in there and suppress the crime at the time. So I'm not excusing these criminals for their criminal conduct. And it's interesting when you talk to, for example, the business owners in the black community, they don't want less police. Right. They want more police, better trained yes. to do the right thing. And I was saying, you don't want this cop to try to be a therapist, an analyst, you want somebody to come in and suppress the crime. Add someone to the team if you want somebody to come in and evaluate these issues. But while he's trying to assess all of this, a baby can be shaken. Somebody can be shot in the head. You need somebody to come in and control the situation and then decide what needs to happen to re-educate and open new corridors of opportunities. But if we don't get funding to create inclusion of this model into the educational system and into the rehabilitation protocols, it'll never happen. If you don't put money behind it, it's not ever going to happen. I, I agree 100%. You've got prevention, treatment, and then you need incapacitation. You need to freeze the situation where safety is restored, and then these other two areas can move, move into place. And I also can't agree with you more about the need for funding. 
this is so critical. And the uh, CDC, you know, the, the Centers for Disease Control, have just been freed up by Congress recently to even begin to start really looking at violence again because they were sort of frozen out of it for a while because the perception was, and that's, this has been the perception, uh, is that the only way to solve um, violence uh, is through gun control, right? And my thought is setting aside whether we can agree or disagree on um, too many too many, too many guns near people that are having a, 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 or who are revenge addicts is always going to lead to a lot of deaths. But my thought is, we now have a way to stop people from being re revenge addicted, and that's called motive control. Motive control instead of gun control offers an opportunity where we can get out of this deadlocked discussion about weapons and start, about, start talking about something new and science-based, which says, even if this, if this, if this table right here was filled to the brim with handguns, I don't think you and I would go at each other, right? I don't think we would because our motive is controlled. No grievances, no desire to retaliate. And even if we did, we're not going to pick up a gun, but there are too many other people that would. So we can work on the motives while we're also trying to sort out, you know, weapons laws. Uh, and by doing that, we're actually going to start saving lives. And I, this is where I have trouble uh, getting the message through with people that are really gun control addicts. And, and I, personally, I think that there should be fewer guns in society. That's my personal view. And I grew up on a farm where I had access to a gun. And I think that's why I think it. it was, that handgun was so close and available to me. And I went after these guys that shot and killed my dog. And I may not be sitting here today, but for that gun, because I right. didn't have my motive control. <laughs> My motive for killing was full on at that moment. Uh, so working on a motive control approach, it turns on the entire medical system. It, it turns on the science system. It turns on mental health and addiction medicine. It turns on all of these vast institutions that we have sitting on the sideline, not knowing what to do about violence. There was a podcast, the New York Times podcast, a month or two ago, had a, this is an incredible story. It was a, a, a psychiatrist in somewhere in California, and she was um, seeing a teenage male who was brought in uh, by the police on fear that he represented a threat. He was going to kill somebody. She evaluated him, and she concluded that he had no diagnosable mental illness but she was also convinced he might go and kill somebody. But she had no diagnosis to give because medical science has none for that kind of person. And so she said, what do I do? If I give him a mental health diagnosis, this is going to contribute to the you know, ruining of his life. He's going to get treatments he probably doesn't need. He's going to walk around with a diagnosis that's going to impact the rest of his days. On the other hand, if I let him walk out of here, he might kill somebody. What do I do? I have, and, and this was, this is a, a top ranked psychiatrist, research psychiatrist at one of the big California universities. And she said, I have no way to treat that boy. And we do now. We do have a way. And that information needs to get out to the medical profession. So if you're going to have a red flag law and you're going to identify somebody that's at a, you know, is a threat. You've got to have something to do with them when you bring them in, other than just throw them in a jail. And this is the way. Uh, but without that research, as you mentioned, without the funding for that work and without funding the education of physicians to be able to use it, we're going to be stuck watching bodies continue to pile up. It's getting worse all the time. And I've been interviewed about this over and over and over after Uvalde and all. People want to ask me about the Second Amendment I said, do you want to make us safer or do you want to talk about the Second Amendment? Because there are like 20,000 AR-15s on the street now. So you can change the Second Amendment, and that may be great for my grandkids' grandkids, but there's probably a 200-year supply of guns on the street right now. I want to focus on what we can do now. Yes what we can do now. And what you're talking about are things we can do that can reduce people's desire to go exact revenge, to go exact retaliation now. 
would it be easier to stop this if they didn't have access to guns? Of course it would. But there are more guns in America than there are Americans because people right. have more than one gun. So there are probably 375 million guns out there. Those aren't going to go away if you change the Second Amendment. They're going to be there. What we got to do is say, what are we going to do about people's motive to use those guns today? This is just something that needs to be center stage. It can be part of the school curriculum. It can be part of dealing with those people if they do get identified. And it really is hijacking the brain. But we can take it back. We can teach them to express this in other ways. And your app that talks about trying these real or imagined transgressors in their mind is truly cathartic. And oftentimes you only have to get like these mass shooters or school shooters, you only have to get them by that moment. That's it may never point. come back again. It may never come back again. If you can get them past that moment, because we don't have the ability to predict who's going to do it, but we do have a pathway of knowing how they got to that moment, and it includes a mental emotional crisis recently. It includes, we know most of them happen in September and January, February when they've come back to school. Mm -hmm. It's usually when they've been rejected or broken up with a girlfriend or whatever. Always a grievance that starts it. Uh, real or imagined. Mm -hmm. Real or imagined. They've been aggrieved. So it's that perfect storm that comes together. And we know that a high majority of them get their guns at home. If we had a huge campaign to lock up the guns, I mean, really, I think back to the Just Say No campaign for drugs, not on how successful it was or not, but just how prolific that campaign was. If we had that prolific a campaign of lock up the guns, it's hard to shoot somebody with a gun you don't have. Right. That's right. If we could identify them and had a reporting system, and then there were people on the other end of that reporting system that were trained with this information could have a profound effect right now. That's correct. And, and look at what we do with driving, young drivers. Before you can get behind the wheel of a lethal weapon, which is an automobile in the right hands, we give young drivers a lot of training. And I'm not, you know, everybody talks about gun training in terms of, you know, making sure that you don't keep a bullet in the chamber and making sure that you understand where the safety is and that your finger's off the trigger, all these things, all of that's very important. But what we don't train people to do uh, uh, before they acquire a gun is teach them about these, this powerful revenge process and that the weapon, a gun is the, it's the ultimate um, substance of abuse. Alcohol is a substance of abuse. We always think of it that way, tobacco, narcotics. These are substances of abuse. So you take an, a, a substance that's sitting here, you know, on a table by itself sitting there. If there was a pile of opioids here, it would present no threat to us. It would just be sitting here. The question is, is do I have a motive to abuse it? What does that mean to abuse it? That means to ingest it, to give myself pleasure, and then to keep doing that over and over again. Same thing with a weapon. A weapon is, is nothing more than a substance of abuse. It is an object that, that somebody who is a revenge addict will use to abuse to give themselves pleasure. But we have no training for this. Before you can acquire an, an AR-15, it might be nice if you had at least an hour or something, a video, anything, that said, hey, just so you know, that is a very powerful weapon and you can mow down a lot of people. The people who do that, who mow down a lot of people, had that moment where they lost control. They had a, a desire to inflict revenge on mass scale. The weapon was handy and they went after it. You need to know that. And you need, and here are some strategies or resources that you can have so that if you're going to actually have a weapon like that anywhere near you, you ought to be damn well trained to control your own revenge cravings and to keep that weapon away from people who are going through that process. And, and I liked what you said about getting them through the moment. It might be one time moment. Once you get them past it, they'd never come back to thinking about a mass shooting. But it's 
can we get them beyond that one process? Can we help them control their motive? And uh, you know, my uh, you mentioned two things. You mentioned the SavingCane.org website. On that website, SavingCane.org, you know, I have uh, the warning signs of a revenge attack, and these are the signs that came from the FBI and the Secret Service studying uh, what are the signs of somebody who's getting close to committing an act of violence, usually even a mass shooting. And that in it always includes first dwelling on a grievance, dwelling on a feeling of mistreatment or injustice. When you know somebody's doing that, that's a low level warning sign that there might be a problem, but they don't probably need anything other than watching. But if that progresses to now I'm talking about retaliating and I'm talking about committing an act of violence against the person who wronged me or their proxy, now we really need to start paying attention to this person. We need to get them resources now before they're anywhere near stage eight where they're picking up the gun and, and actually doing the shooting. So there are ways to manage this, uh, but then we've, we've got to get this out. We need a public health campaign the way the American Heart Association went on an incredible campaign, I don't know how many decades ago it was, for know the warning signs of a heart attack, know the warning signs of a stroke, know these things. If you see them, know that that's a life-threatening emergency and it's time to call 911. And don't delay, do it, go to an ER, do it. Don't treat it as something you need to be humiliated about, just go and get some help. Or if you know somebody that's doing this, get them the help that they need. There's certainly millions and millions of school-age kids. Right now, they think telling is tattling and snitches get stitches. If we could get a paradigm shift where they understand, if I see something over here that's concerning and I have somewhere to go with that information, and the paradigm shift is I'm helping a young man in pain get some help instead of I'm ratting him out and getting him in trouble— if we have that paradigm shift, then they're more likely to do that, particularly if they can do it anonymously and they realize they're not getting this young man in trouble, they're getting him some help. In the schools, we can help in that way. And the same thing in society at large. There's got to be somewhere that they can go with this information because, as you know, most of these people, school shooters and mass shooters in general, what is it, close to 80% of them tell at least one person what they're going to do and when they're going to do it, and 60 some percent tell at least two people what they're going to do and when they're going to do it, and about half of those include law enforcement. They just don't know what to do about it. Right. But if they had something to do about it. Yeah. And in earlier, in earlier stages, I'm sure they're telling a lot of people about their victimization, and, yeah. and that's, being, you know, that's being ignored. If you see, if a child saw a person having an asthma attack and not being able to breathe in a classroom, they would talk to a teacher and say, so-and-so is, you know, or they're bleeding, you know, they've cut themselves. Uh, this needs to be treated like a health issue and, many, and, and if necessary, an emergency. And when we, when we do that and start helping each other and we start discouraging the acting out of revenge for pleasure, which is so encouraged now, right, in our society, yeah. that is encouraged on the internet. It is encouraged on social networking platforms. If you have any grievance, you should put that out there, get a bunch of people to jump on board and agree, and let's go, uh, you know, in whatever side you're on, let's have a cancel moment. And that's what cancel culture is a retaliation act. Likewise, so is a mass shooting. They're all just the different ways of retaliating because somebody feels you know, wrong. And it's to make yourself feel better. When this is all encouraged and when it's all you know, supported um, from leadership uh, on down, you create a population level experience, uh, as we've talked about before, where the entire population or many people, too many people in the society are experiencing uh, revenge addiction. And, and, you know, that's why I say, you know, the United States is becoming a justice addicted nation. And my book that's coming out next year, that's the title of it, where I'm trying to get that information out even further on top of the miraclecourt.com website, uh, which is that mobile app that you were mentioning as well. Well, I'm going to list that along with the other. And I am going to ask you when your book is done and ready Next year, you'll come back on the show and the podcast and let me help launch that and get it out there so people can read it and know what's out there. 
That'd be fantastic. That'd be great. Appreciate and that. I appreciate you coming back here for a second time and talking about this because this is about saving lives. Exactly right. You hate to see those that are retaliating and getting themselves in a pickle. It's just like we were looking earlier at that tape of the guy throwing the cash register to the window that the guy was taping him saying, hey, man, they're going to call the cops on you. Somebody's trying to help him out and he wouldn't listen. Here, people can be committing murder and getting in all kinds of hell and then their life's destroyed, the victim's life's destroyed. This can save lives. So thank you for talking about this again. This is important stuff. It needs to get a lot of focus and a lot of attention. I'm going to do the best I can to make sure that happens. Well, you know, thank you for being that voice and and supporting this. And and I think you're in a position to advance this in ways where it needs to go, which is just, this is something for every average person. It's not for experts. This isn't, and it's not political. It's not, you know, it's not a liberal thing or a conservative thing. It's, it's a human thing. We're all in this boat together and we can either all, you know, turn ourselves into a circular firing squad or we can put our guns down. And I think there's a way to help people put those guns yeah, down. It's science. It's just simply science. science. So right. we'll keep doing this work. Let's stay in touch and we'll talk about this some more. Thanks, Bill. All right. Thanks for coming again. We'll talk soon. 